Thanks everyone for joining. This is in our Sanford series that we've been having on technology policy conversations for the summer with leaders in the technology policy area and having conversations about the substance of what they work on, but also on their careers and how they charted a course to have the influential positions that they have. This is part of our overall technology policy program at Sanford at Duke, and that our cyber policy program is a part of. And so without further ado, I'd like to really thank Ginny Bedanes for being willing to join us here, a Duke graduate coming back to talk to us about what she's done after Duke. And so Ginny is the Director of Strategic Projects at Microsoft for their Defending Democracy program. We're gonna talk about what that means and what the goals of that particular program are. I do wanna let everyone know that we're recording this session. Uh, Ginny and I are going to talk for about 40 minutes and then we're gonna open up for questions. I originally thought I could actually ask people to just add, uh, raise their hand in the tool, but now I'm noticing that only the panelists have the ability to raise their hands and that those of you as attendees don't. So please enter your question in the chat and then I can read the questions out of the chat. Uh, and then Ginny will be able to, to respond to them. So to kick this off, Ginny, I want to dig right in. I know your Defending Democracy Project at Microsoft has three goals, from what I understand. Preserve and protect the electoral processes, protect campaign organizations from hacking, and defend against disinformation campaigns. Some of our attendees may be surprised that a private sector company like Microsoft has those priorities. Why is Microsoft resourcing this program? Uh, thanks for the question. Thank you for having me this afternoon. I love to interact with Duke students and this is a great opportunity, uh, even though it's remote, hopefully we can do it together sometime in person. Um, that's actually a question that my colleagues and I receive a lot. Some people ask us, you know, why is Microsoft doing this out of curiosity? Sometimes it's out of skepticism, um, but regardless of why they ask, it does at first to some people seem to be counterintuitive that a big company would be investing in a program like this. But if you think back to really a big eye-opening moment for uh, most of us, the 2016 US elections, and you look at the rise in nation state enabled uh, threat actors targeting democratic institutions, so political campaigns, election infrastructure, think tanks, um, academia, when you see those attacks and the fact that 2016, while it was a big moment, was not the first. This was a progression. We saw efforts like this in Ukraine for many years. There was a lot in Europe and France and Germany and elsewhere. And so as you noted that there is a rise in this activity, um, our company and our leadership also noted that the wars of today are not the same as the wars of yesterday, um, and neither are the battlefields. And so what's sort of interesting when you think of the wars of today and what the battlefields are, the reality is tech platforms like Microsoft's, that's the new battlefield. That's where these wars are being waged. And so whether we want to be a part of this or not, we have skin in the game. Big tech companies are a part of this conversation. And with that comes some obligations. And those obligations are everything from supporting our customers who are protecting themselves in this space um, to doing more, and that might be uh, technology, resources, thought leadership, but it's also public policy. What can we do to advance, advance norms around cyber attacks, things like that? So Microsoft has a vested interest um, because we are a part of it, whether we want to be or not. In addition to that, for the more skeptical audience, um, we also note when you look at where companies like Microsoft do the most business, it's in democracies. And so there is a, bus, a business justification and a business case to be made that it is important to us to protect those democracies, those fundamental institutions, because that is where we do the majority of our business and therefore there is a good reason for us to uh, protect them. So Jenny, maybe if, if we could uh, drill into that just a little bit more. I, it's fascinating when you describe that Microsoft is the battlefield. Actually, I, I, was, uh, I was not sure that uh, you were going to take uh, that perspective on, on the question. Microsoft also has a pretty diverse business right now from the cloud business to your enterprise software business to you know, things like the Xbox business and actually being a hardware supplier. 
Does that play out differently in the aspects to which Microsoft is the battlefield? And uh, how, I know I'm, I'm catching you by surprise on this question probably a little bit. But one of the things that I find, find interesting within private sector companies is oftentimes it's important to stay connected with the business, but when you've got a diverse business with lots of different executives who have very different interests and are impacted differently, mm -hmm. when you say Microsoft's the battlefield, how does that play out across this diverse business? Well, it's, you're actually making the case that was made internally for why we needed a sort of special program for this. Because in other instances, you might think, well, we just build uh, this capability within the product team that is most affected, right? Um, so we'll just go to our Office 365, you know, our email tools, and that's where this is an issue because of uh, all of the phishing and whatnot. But to your point, it's it's not just one point of entry. We have a lot of considerations. So LinkedIn, for example, is a Microsoft property. A lot of people don't know that. Um, LinkedIn is the closest we come to having a social network um, because that's not really the way that Microsoft operates. But when we think about securing uh, our customers around democratic institutions, we don't just think about network security. That is extremely important. But we also think about disinformation defense and how do we look across the company at all of our platforms, make sure we're we have a unified perspective on things because to your point, the folks at Xbox are probably not thinking that they are a target or an area where they need to be concerned when it comes to election security. They're probably right, but it's our job to be thinking about what kind of threats they might be facing and how do we as a company respond and make sure we're all talking to each other. Because in many ways, silos are problematic, but especially when it comes to security, you need to knock down those silos as much as you can and make sure you're all talking. And policy is the same thing, both internal policies about how we respond to things um, and you know, what do we do about takedown orders and, how, and what I mean by that is if we're being asked to take down content, how do we respond? What are our policies that we stand on? Um, and that goes into a lot of different fields outside of just security and elections. But um, in addition to the, the takedowns and those sort of things, also just how do we communicate about external policies to lawmakers, regulators? How do we address those issues in one voice? So it sounds like your role is actually even more bi-directional possibly than I had originally thought it would be that you're not only talking about external relationships to the regulators in these different democracies and uh, on these different issues, but also with the individual businesses and working with them to understand how it actually impacts their business goals. Can you talk about how Microsoft sets that up a little bit and how you fulfill that role? Sure, it's probably easiest to describe with an example. And one example is that uh, when we first launched the program and we were focusing on disinformation uh, defense, we actually had a fourth pillar. So you just described our three pillars, essentially election security, campaign security, and disinformation defense. But we also had a focus initially around advertising um, because as we recall from the 2016 elections and it's debatable how much of an influence it had online advertising was a um, threat vector that needed to be considered. And so we wanted to take that on. So we started going from one product team to the other to understand what their online policies were for, or what their policies were for online political advertisements. And at the time they all allowed it. And we wanted to make sure that we had a cohesive approach to how you did online advertising for political campaigns. Because again, you know, the LinkedIn folks may not be talking to the Bing team, which may not be talking to MSN about how they handle these situations or Microsoft News. And so that was an example of, of where we got everybody together. We thought through the various policy options. We're not there to force anything on anyone. We're really more there to create a conversation and to give our advice and feedback. Ultimately, the businesses are going to decide to do what they do. And in those cases, it was slightly different timing. They all essentially decided that not having political ads on the platform was the way to go. That was a, geez, almost two years ago um, that that decision was made. And we've seen other um, technology companies since come around to a similar perspective. And so I think we were able to get a little bit of a step up on that by having a team who was focused on those initiatives and those efforts and not just reacting to something that was happening in the media or in, in real time on the platform. So that that's fascinating to me because I would say that's not a one-off from what I've seen from Microsoft for the past decade, actually, of being actually out in front of 
these global public policy issues for, that are impacting technology. But uh, it really giving some thought and being a leader there. In my class that I teach every fall, my undergraduate class, Intro to Cyber Policy, one of the themes of the class is that people are important. And I, I was wondering if you're comfortable talking a little bit about Brad Smith seems to have been so incredibly important as a visionary leader of the role that these projects can play, not just in stabilizing the market, which is I think a bit of what you were talking about earlier for Microsoft, but also for Microsoft's brand and how pe people perceive Microsoft as a member of the global community. And so uh, could you talk a little bit about that and about the sort of what it takes for a leader to propel a large company like that forward in that type of an area? Absolutely. And so for those of you who aren't familiar, which I wasn't when I joined Microsoft, so I don't blame you, Brad Smith is the president of Microsoft. And that's not to be confused with our CEO, Satya Nadella. Um, the timing worked out that I joined Microsoft about a month after Satya became CEO. And so a lot of people told me, you're so lucky you're part of the new Microsoft. I never knew what the old Microsoft was or what that meant. Um, and we don't need to linger on that, but to your point about leadership, um, I credit both Satya and Brad for being real innovators and leaders in, in this space. And it really does come down to culture. And I know I sound like a South by Southwest talking head, talking about culture, um, but it's really interesting how true that is. Um, Satya set out from like his first day to focus on customers. He has a saying about being customer obsessed and have that be the first thing that you think about in every scenario. And the repetition of hearing that is a little annoying. Uh, we hear it at every all hands. We see it in every email. It's constant. But the repetitiveness is actually really important um, because it does actually change the culture when people are thinking that way and managers are managing that way. Brad has been a real leader when it comes to identifying issues that are, that are very prevalent, but maybe not being talked about very much and looking for where Microsoft has something to say or do about it that can make a difference. And so one example that Brad has done um, with our organization is identified, this is pretty early on in 2016, maybe 2017, early 2017, he um, challenged uh, some teams to focus on what we as a company could do to bring access, broadband access to rural communities. Um, and that's really where a, a whole project out of Microsoft called the Microsoft Airband Project started was focusing on, we know that there are people who have to go to McDonald's in order to get Wi-Fi, and that's how they're doing their homework. Um, and man, was that not more, uh, the foresight on that was of course not considering a pandemic was coming. It was just saying there are people who are being left behind because they don't have access. So they can't apply for jobs online and they can't take um, certifications online and do the things that many of us take for granted. But education is a huge part of that too. Well, now that we're in this virtual world, where my kids are doing school online, and I'm sad to say it looks like they will be next semester as well. Um, if we didn't have that connectivity, I'm not sure what we would do and I'd be very concerned about them. So having a leader who identifies an issue, uh, comes up with the kernel of an idea of how we approach it and then empowers a team to execute is incredibly powerful. And I don't know the figures myself because it's not my team though I probably should, but there are some millions numbers of, of households that have been connected through this project and it's an ongoing effort um, and it's just one of many that that he has sort of spearheaded and created these sort of ninja teams like ours to take on and tackle. I'm so glad that you talked about culture. And it's something that I talk to students about, particularly there's lots of different ways to impact public policy and serving in government is a wonderful way to do that. But there are also ways, whether you're working in NGOs or whether you're working within standards organizations or, or industry associations, but also working in private sector companies. I really encourage everybody, before you're taking a job, really do some research on what the culture of the organization and make sure it's a good fit for you. And one way to do that is, you know, Sasha Nadella's book is fantastic, uh, as is Brad Smith's book. And to have people who come from the different backgrounds that they have from the way that's imprinted the company, unless you've worked for a large tech company, it's hard to understand how important that is and whether you're going to be happy with the work that you're doing, but this because so much of the culture comes from the top down uh, and what the, what the focus is gonna be. But maybe, is it okay if we transition into 
talking a little bit about the substance of how that's played out? Sure. All right, so let me, we're rapidly approaching the 2020 presidential election. And I, I'm just, maybe a broad question, do you think we're prepared to defend the election from cybersecurity attacks? Where's, where's the day-to-day -day work at? How are you feeling? So there are certainly different opinions on this, um, and, but you asked me, so I'll give you my opinion on it. Um, and I, I think it's really important to start by looking at where we all were four years ago. And by we, in this case, I'm referring to stakeholders in the election, the general um, election security community. And it was uh, disorganized. Um, and as, as I think many of you will know, but again, I sometimes take for granted how much people know about the mechanisms of our elections. Our elections are not run at the federal level. Um, there are some federal oversight entities, but they're, um, they're not who runs our elections. They're not really even run at the state level. Um, it, this is where you get into state by state, it's different, who has authority and who's in charge. Uh, but for the most part in our country, the elections are administrated at the county level. And so we're talking about a county clerk who is responsible for the systems, the machines, the process, the poll workers, the whole thing for their particular county. And an example that I've heard used before, and I don't know where it came from, but I've stolen it, is essentially if you were to consider asking a local county sheriff to protect their county from a invasion from a foreign army, we would all laugh and say, well, of course we wouldn't expect a sheriff to be able to take that on. Um, but that's essentially what we have asked of our county election officials. And so uh, a sort of makeshift army has surrounded them over the last four years. And that's made up of stakeholders from DHS. Um, they have a division called CISA that has done excellent work. Uh, it's a new division or it's renamed anyways in the last few years. Um, but they are, they are very focused on the elections. It's, they have a team that never existed before that's focused on election security. They also have a team that's focused on disinformation and elections. So there are two different task forces that are very focused on this issue. Um, and then there are stakeholders like us, the, the private industry. Um, I was actually on a call just right before this call with colleagues from industry and from government. It's a regular call where we talk about election security and we talk about what we're seeing and trends and how we're approaching things. Um, so that kind of call didn't happen four years ago. In fact, the people who were on that call didn't know each other. Maybe industry knew each other, meaning the tech companies. I knew my colleague at Facebook and someone knew their colleague at Google, um, but we didn't know who to call at DHS. And if you, are, if you followed what happened in 2016 and you read all of the different reports in the Senate intelligence report and all that, which I expect most of you did not, but if you look at that, one thing that you'll note is that when the FBI called the DNC to let them know that they had been breached, uh, the guy didn't call the FBI back because he didn't believe it. I think he thought it was false or he, he thought he was being tricked. Um, and nobody, they, wor they worked three blocks apart, but nobody got up and walked over to the other building to talk to each other. It just went unhandled for several weeks while, um, while the adversary was in the system and, and pulling out information. And so, when you look at that and where we started versus now, where everyone is talking, there's a, um, it'll likely be virtual, but there's sort of a situation room, war room that DHS puts together that in some format, all of the companies and the other, um, the other government uh, teams participate in where we monitor what's going on, we share information, we respond quickly, we all have incident plans, uh, incident response plans. So that's a long way of saying we're in a much better place, we again collectively, than we were four years ago. All that being said, we still have county clerks who are on the front line. We still have the perception or anticipation of a foreign adversary attacking those front lines. And if any of you are following cybersecurity, generally you know that no system is 100% secure. Um, there are always ways that someone can get in. Um, but what we see is a resilience that wasn't there before. And that's sort of what I'm, all that buildup is getting to that point. Yeah. We have a far more resilient election system than we did before. It doesn't mean it's impenetrable. It doesn't mean it's perfect, but there are resources available. People have a better sense of what to do if something happens. Um, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, and I anticipate our elections being more secure in the next two years, next four years, et cetera. Uh, but we're certainly in a better position than we were four years ago. So can you talk a little bit more, Ginny, about when you mentioned the term resilience? I mean, I think for 
many of us, when we're doing uh, cybersecurity, that makes complete sense what we mean by that. And the focus on that, given the fact that we know we can't completely protect the network or the infrastructure from attacks, can you talk about what does resilience really mean when we're talking about the election? Well, it can mean some of the more traditional cyber terms, meaning it, people are learning and when they're building out their networks now to not have a single admin account that if hacked gets to everything, right? And that it's like a front line that thing for their email, right? That That is a practice that, um, I, I mean, I can't speak for the entire country. I'm sure we still have some that are doing that, but for the most part, they have learned that you create sort of layers of security so that if one area is breached, it doesn't get to the entirety of the network or the system. So I do mean resilience in part in the traditional cybersecurity resilience way of you make sure that you have blockers in place so you can't get to the whole thing from a single single entity or single breach. Um, but it's also a, a bit of an attitude, honestly. It's, it's um, a way of thinking that you are prepared to respond. Um, and a lot of this comes into disinformation too. These election officials have learned what to do if they spot on Twitter or, or somewhere online, uh, someone putting false information out about, let's say the location of their polling site um, and whether it's intentional or not, um, these local election officials who were previously afraid to speak publicly about anything or certainly not on social media, most of them now have a plan that good information beats out bad. The best way to stop this misinformation is to put out accurate information. And in order to do that, you have to build a presence online first, so you're a trusted source. And so a lot of local election officials, especially secretaries of state across the country, have been building out a presence so that on election day, if something false is put out and they say something online to combat it, they're trusted. People know who they are. They've got the blue check mark. They're the secretary of state for their state who's responsible for elections. They're the authority. Um, so it's resilience both in the traditional technical cyber term, but also in an attitude and uh, an incident response plan that you know what to do if something goes wrong. So, you know, I, it feels to me like we've been within the folks who've focused on cybersecurity for the past 10 or 15 years, we've been trying to get organizations to build better resilience for a long time. But it does feel to me like things have changed and organizations are starting to take it more seriously. Can you talk a little bit more, I wanna talk about disinformation in, in a minute, but um, can you talk a little bit more about what specifically, I, I, it feels to me like Microsoft has had a huge impact the last couple of years. Can you talk a little bit more about what you as a, pro, what your program has actually done and the successes of encouraging organizations to, because you were talking about in, forcing organizations or encouraging organizations to devote scarce resources that they could use for something else to this. It's people, I think people don't understand that it's not just people are ignoring things, but they've got 10 different competing interests and they've got a limited set of dollars and people that they can throw at things. And they need to be convinced that this is something that they need to prioritize. So I'd be really interested in how your program is providing them with materials and are interfacing with them in a way that's been so impactful. Well, yeah, we, when we first started, and, and keep in mind, we're talking a lot about elections, but campaigns are a big part of this too. And one of the first things we did when we started was identify, um, look, what happened, what went wrong in the Podesta email scenario. He was using a personal email address um, and he was fished and it's kind of a long story, but he entered in his credentials and they got access to his account. So it was a little bit of a light bulb moment for some of us in this space to realize, you know, these folks are not just being attacked on their official accounts, they're being attacked on their personal accounts, they're being attacked anywhere that someone can find them. An individual that is a target is a target everywhere, not just on their, on their official account. What that meant though, is it put the people who were responsible for protecting political campaigns in a really tough spot because they can't enforce multi-factor authentication onto a staff member's Facebook account. Um, and that's not something they have in their control. So one, one thing we set out to do was help those administrators um, in two ways. One, we launched a program called Account Guard, which was focused on first um, customers. They, they had to be customers because we can't help if they're not using our, our infrastructure. Um, you'll see what I mean. So if someone, if a campaign was using our email system and they opted into this program, 
um, what we did was we got our threat intelligence team involved and connected with that political campaign so that now we have a sense that what originally looked like just a normal generic Office 365 account is in fact a senatorial campaign or a presidential campaign. And, and that way our threat intelligence team has a slightly better idea of what's happening if they see attack, an attack happening against that account. We also then invited them to bring in personal accounts. Now again, it, we can only see what is in our infrastructure. So this was only Microsoft personal accounts, but if you had a Hotmail account or a Skype account, you could opt into this program as well if you were part of this campaign. And, uh, and then if we saw attacks happening again, versus what would normally look like just a generic Hotmail account, we now know this is affiliated in the political space. And that's important information and allows us to respond faster. So we can get to the individual and the organization quicker with notifications and recommendations for how they proceed, um, depending on if they were breached or if it was just an attack. Uh, the other thing we did was to that point about you can't force someone to turn multi-factor on, on another account. We, did, we started launching a series of trainings that we've really been doing consistently over the last two years, meeting, and this is a global effort. So we go to, uh, we spent a lot of time in Europe last year working ahead of the EU parliament elections, uh, but also in the US. And now we're doing a whole series virtually where we're training uh, campaign staff and in, in many cases, election teams as well on some fundamental cybersecurity hygiene types of things to just give them a sense of what they can do to protect themselves. And uh, in some cases, we sit there and actually make them turn multi-factor authentication on, on their Facebook account, and just stand over their shoulder until they do it. Um, so there are some things we've been doing in those efforts to try and help the, that environment be a little more secure. What I love about that answer is that I think a lot of folks, coming back to the first thing that you said uh, in this talk, has been that people think that there may not be a disconnect between what an effort like this would be and what the business motivations of the business are. But when you start recognizing these are customers and these are customers that may not be seeing the needs that they're having and or knowing how to solve them and being once again, that concept of customer obsession and where you can find that public policy and doing the right thing for the overall environment and public policy is also really good for the business. That's a great place to be as an employee and as a professional, I think. And can I share one of my favorite memories where I really felt like I was able to take the lessons I'd learned at Duke in public policy, which for the early part of my career, I hadn't really used as much, was to your point about making these tools accessible to our customers to keep them safe. There's a law that you're not as a corporation allowed to give something to a political campaign of value. Uh, it's illegal, it's a corporate contribution and you can't do that. And so what we were trying to figure out is we wanted to launch this account guard program. We had it all figured out, but our lawyers were telling us no. They were saying, you can't do it. It's illegal, it's an in-kind contribution. None of us wanna to go to jail, which I concurred with. Um, but what we did instead was we went directly to the Federal Election Commission, the FEC, and appealed to them through a process they have called an advisory opinion, where we made the case that you just made actually, we said, we have a brand reputation issue here where if one of our customers gets popped, if they get hacked and there's big hack and leak and it's a presidential campaign and it becomes front page news everywhere and everywhere it says Microsoft products, we have a brand reputation that we are trying to protect. And this is a thing we think we can do to protect this kind of customer. And so for our own sake, can you please allow us to provide this service for free? And they unanimously, which at the time was shocking because they're a partisan board, they unanimously agreed to give us um, the permissions to provide this service for free to US political campaigns. And I got to testify in front of the FEC and help write draft the letter and all of that. And it was a really exciting opportunity to take something I was passionate about and put it into use in order to have real impact. And then maybe the thing I'm most proud of from that is the number of advisory opinions that came after us because other companies started to realize this is a thing you could do so Harvard actually has a program, they now have an offshoot nonprofit group that came out of a Harvard program that uh, appealed using our advisory opinion to say that they could help navigate these free offerings from companies like ours and provide them to campaigns. And so they've funded an entire nonprofit around this, this concept, this advisory opinion. And so we were, we were really able to move things forward and help using our, our public policy background in order to do it. How incredibly rewarding to see that impact at a larger scale. That That's incredible. Let, let's change gears just a little bit and talk about the disinformation campaigns. It's been in the news 
so much. If you could, could you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing right now to combat false information and particularly who the partners are that you work with on that? Sure. So we, again, I mentioned before, we're not a big social media platform. So while this is not something that normally people think of when they think of Microsoft, we recognize that we have a few things to bring to the table on this. Uh, one is our people and our technology. Um, another is our resources. And so when we first entered into how do we, as Microsoft, take on disinformation, the first thing that we did was say, let's identify people who are doing really great work in this area, and let's just, let's give them some resources, some funding, access to our researchers and engineers, and just, you know, have them move forward, empower what they're doing as we figure out what we're going to, uh, what else we're going to add to the conversation. At that time, this concerning issue uh, that's just really starting to actually show up in, in the real world called deep fakes started to come about. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the term deep fakes, it's also referred to as synthetic media. And there are some funny and disturbing videos that you can find on YouTube and elsewhere where uh, Nicolas Cage for some reason keeps getting brought into it, where faces of celebrities all of a sudden change into Nicolas Cage and his voice and their voices get mixed and all of a sudden it looks like it's a different person. That's one example of synthetic media. Um, you've also maybe seen one where, uh, where someone is pretending to be Barack Obama and it looks like he is saying things that he never said, which of course you know because this is a funny video and so they're making it funny. Um, but if you didn't know that, you might be led to believe that President Obama really said what these what these folks are putting into his mouth. And so it's the use of uh, artificial intelligence to take real videos or images or audio and and change them in such a way that you don't notice. You're you can't tell from the naked eye that it's not the person saying doing acting in a way that they never actually did. Um, this is a rising concern in politics. You can you can immediately imagine scenarios where um, where someone puts out a video, it makes its way across the internet so quickly that by the time someone tries to deny it, the, the rumors and the conspiracy theories have already started. So we're working with um, a lot of partners on that one, including Facebook, and we actually, I think have some announcements coming out about it somewhat soon where we'll have more information, but we're working at taking that on both from the technical standpoint, but also what resources can be made available to media because you really don't want those false videos making their way to the trusted sites, um, the networks, the big, the big publishers. And so we're doing a lot of work in that area. When it comes to media literacy, we've partnered with an organization called NewsGuard um, that I would encourage everybody to check out. They have, um, we've sponsored a free web extension on Edge. So you may not all use Edge, but if you want to, you can pull up Edge and install the web extension for free on our browser uh, to do some of your news searching to see what it looks like. But the way NewsGuard approaches the issue of false news is they go to the publisher level and they actually have journalists, trained journalists who have spent many years um, in the field who will review a site based on a set of criteria that are, are journalistic integrity criteria that are generally agreed to by the journalistic community. Um, things like, do they have a, um, do they release the, the source of their funding? Like where do they get their money? Do they uh, ha have a corrections policy and do they frequently post corrections? Um, there's about nine of them that will, that will all sound very logical to you. So they will go to a site and they'll measure that site against those criteria and give them a score. And so when you're using the browser extension, if you're doing a Google search or a Bing search and you see news articles pop up, you'll see a little green or a little red shield next to the source. And you can scroll over it and it'll show you how they scored on those different criteria. Um, and if you want to, you can actually click through and go through and read a whole article about how they did their research. And they always reach out for comment. Did they get comment back? Have they made changes? Um, and I'm really excited to say that since they launched about a year and a half ago, They've had 500 different sites make changes to the way they did things in order to get a better score. In some cases, it was already green rated sites who wanted 100% green. Um, but in other cases, uh, there, were, there were some sites that you, know, you might consider a little controversial who didn't used to have a corrections policy that now does. And then they also started revealing the source of their funding and all of a sudden they got themselves to green. They still have some red X's, but they're doing a lot better. And that's the kind of change we're actually trying to drive. It's all about trusted information. Who do you go to? How do you trust? It's not about us telling you what you can click through to. It's not about um, stopping content. It's about giving you information that you as a consumer can, can take and use if you'd like, or you can just move forward with, and read whatever you'd like to read. What I love about that example is it notes that 
there are sometimes uh, situations where what we need to do is advocate to government organizations for public policy actions they need to take to protect people. But there's an awful lot of things that we can do for public policy concerns to develop partnerships and private sector responses to arm individuals to be able to make choices for themselves. And I, I think I know Bill, uh, Professor Bill Adair at the, at the Sanford School has been doing a lot of work in this area and a lot of work on deep fakes. And for students who are attending this who are really interested in that issue, I encourage you to seek out Professor Adair to participate in his work in this area and the work that the Center for Media and Democracy does because it's hugely important. And I think it's right at the center of these areas where the development of standards, the private sector response, including then trying to figure out what's the right role for government. It seems to me to be one of the biggest issues for the next five to 10 years. So that, that, was, that was great. Ginny, we've just got a few more minutes before I wanna open up for uh, student questions. But I'd love it if you could tell a little bit of the story about how did you get from being a Duke undergraduate to get to the point where you're doing this amazing work and making this huge impact in public policy? Because I think a lot of students are sitting back saying, yeah, this is great, but I don't know where to go from where I am now to get there to have that kind of a position. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not something you can do a work back on, right? Um, it, I did, the job that I have now did not exist when I was a Duke. So the idea that I could have been planning or somehow navigating my career to get me to this place um, is laughable because there, there was no defending democracy program at Microsoft. This wasn't a concept. It wasn't anything anyone was thinking about. Um, and so what I instead encourage students to do when we talk about how do you get to these kinds of jobs is focus on where your interests are and where you have strengths and where you have opportunity and then just keep your eyes open and stay hungry as you work your way through your career and take opportunities as they come available. Um, the way that I got to where I am now, I was, as you mentioned, um, I took a lot of public policy, but technically I'm a political science grad. Um, I started taking political science classes and got very interested in it, had taken so many before I actually discovered public policy. Um, but I took as many cross-listed courses as I could. So I call Sanford sort of my adopted home. They've been very good about letting me be a part of the community. Um, but when I was there, I, I found that I was interested in things like um, writing briefs and um, analyzing bills. And so I was pretty sure what I wanted to do was work on the Hill. So after graduating Duke, um, I came to DC, rented a house with uh, four other Duke girls, shared a room with a girl. I mean, we had no jobs, we had no money. Um, our lease was a mess with the number of co-signers we had, but we, we knew we wanted to be in DC. We all had different dreams about what we were gonna do there. Um, I did not get a job on the Hill. I, I interviewed, I had great connections, I had a good resume. Um, it hadn't occurred to me that jobs aren't just open, you know, that it's all about timing. Um, instead, somebody that I had sent a resume to had forwarded it to a friend who was doing a lot of work on a presidential campaign uh, for a private company. And they were looking for people to come in and help. And uh, the company had a good reputation and there were people that we knew in common. And so I kind of took a leap um, thinking I would do that for you know four or five months and then go back to my Hill job um, search. But I found that I really loved the energy of working in a campaign environment. Uh, meanwhile, having the stability of working at a company uh, that even if my candidate lost, it didn't matter. I still had a job in theory, um, it worked out. And, and then I realized that we, I had joined a company that was a little bit of a disruptor. They were doing something um, that no one had expected them to be able to do. Um, they had stepped into some shoes at a much lower rate than another company had been doing it for years and they were successful. And so all of a sudden I had this opportunity to build a team under me and I was 24 and I had interns and I had staff. Um, and it was again, a lot about timing and opportunity. And I realized as much as I had wanted to go to the Hill I had an opportunity to really build and shape something. And so I stayed there for in total 11 years, working on various campaigns of all sizes. Um, and, and it was really energetic and really fun. And then this opportunity came up at Microsoft and it wasn't actually the team I'm on now. The team I was hired to work on was focused on working with political campaigns on behalf of Microsoft. And they were looking for people who actually worked in that world and came out of campaigns versus just hiring someone up through the company who knew Microsoft really well, but didn't understand the ecosystem. 
Um, I thought that was the right move. Obviously, it worked out for me. Um, but I came into, into the company and learned the culture and, and learned how to operate internally. But I also came with the knowledge of how elections and campaigns work. And so I spent uh, a, a few years, almost four years, working on behalf of the company to connect political campaigns to new and emerging technology. And then, of course, we all know, as we talked about already, what happened in 2016 and the conversations we were having that had started out being about you know, artificial intelligence and big data and uh, data visualization shifted very quickly into security conversations, multi-factor authentication. So I actually don't have a security background, but I've learned a lot. Um, and, uh, and the company has been really great about teaching us up on what we need to know as we transitioned into more of a security focused uh, team. I love that response because there's so many things in there that I think are important for students to hear. That is the old phrase that luck is when preparation meets opportunity, right? right? And so what I often tell students is spend time building skills because you don't know what those opportunities are going to be. The world changes, things happen, two new technologies are innovated, and then there's going to be new things. And you want to have base skills that you can bring to that then and, and apply. And then on a similar way, life happens, right? You know, it's, uh, I don't know about your experience, my experience is it's hard to understand exactly what it's going to be like to manage a career and kids before you actually have kids. You know, people get sick, but if you've done a lot of work in preparation ahead of time, building the right skills so that you can be flexible and take advantage of those opportunities when you see them, even if the first path, the thing that you thought was more the direct line doesn't work out, that ends up being a huge advantage and you end up potentially being able to do even bigger things than you thought you could do at the beginning. Absolutely. So, let, let's open it up, uh, and it turns out it looks like people can uh, can raise their hands. So raise your hand in the tool, and we'll call on you. And we've got Justin Sherman with the first question. So Justin, we're going to unmute you, and you can ask your question. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, thanks, David. So so thank you again for for being here. This has been. Um, interesting and, and, you know, great as well to hear solidarity with abysmal DC rents and uh, living environments. Um, I, I want to ask a question with a, a bit of friendly pushback, because I think you've touched on some, some interesting issues here. We've seen, you know, quite frankly, I think, as you, as you sort of alluded to, a, a pretty abysmal U.S. federal government response to election interference to date, whether that's you know, the Trump administration bashing the IC, refusing to acknowledge Russian active measures and influence ops, whether that's the Senate reports on 2016, which you mentioned, which certainly underscore a lack of coordinated efforts, stalled bills, right, the list goes on. And so, you know, sort of in this environment, I, I look at what various private sector orgs and nonprofits are doing right now to, to advocate for these protections and it's certainly been good in many cases, and, and as you sort of highlighted, really a help to U.S. elections. But I think at the same time, we've also seen in many sectors uh, a sometimes problematic outsourcing of government policy questions to the private sector. And so my question is, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what the most urgent U.S. government policy changes need to be on election security, whether that's bills or, as you mentioned, sort of structural adaptations within USG, the NSC, et cetera, to deal with this. Um, and of course, as well, that could include with private sector cooperation. Sure. Um, so there was actually a really, uh, well, I won't say a really good bill, but there was a really strong foundational bill about election security that was bipartisan, um, which I know sounds shocking if, if you all aren't following it, Justin, I'm guessing you are, but it was the klobuchar Lankford bill um, that was in 2018, early 2018, I think really drafted. And it was the it was very promising, um, in that it took into consideration concerns that uh, some of the more conservative Republicans had about states' rights and whether we were over over um, giving the gov federal government too much power over elections. Uh, took those into consideration while also noting there are some things that need to be changed here. There are some regulations that we can put in place to ensure better security and communication and collaboration. 
um, it was a, I thought it was a really great starting point, um, but politics came into play and we got too close to the presidential election. And I, I don't pretend to have been on the inside of why it fell apart, um, but it fell apart. And then the, part, the bills that started to emerge from there were all partisan for the most part, um, which was certainly disappointing. Like we absolutely would like to see a bipartisan election security bill um, make its way through Congress into the president's desk. I, I think it could have been done. I think there were enough areas of agreement that it probably could have happened. Um, I think that's an, it's incredibly important. So you're, you're asking what I think is most important. I think having some of these fundamental um, uh, security pieces put into place is really important, but I don't see that happening before you know November, obviously, um, unfortunately. What could happen um, between now and November, in fact, what, what will, could happen between now and three weeks from now is providing at least some additional resources to the states. Um, and I think in the, in the previous, the HEROES Act, there was like $400 million that was allocated to the states, no strings attached, which is really important because that meant it wasn't dictating what they would do with the money. It was giving the states the ability to apply it how they needed it. Um, and there's a huge push going on right now for additional funding to the states. The Brennan Center at NYU um, has come out with an estimate that we actually need anywhere from two to four billion um, to, to be allocated to the states for them to both be secure and also to operate safely during a COVID environment. Um, and I, while I don't anticipate Congress doing that, I do think we have some promise that there will be some additional funding. And I think if we're being practical about what can happen between now and November, the best hope we have is additional funding for the states so that they can protect their voters, their poll workers um, from COVID-19, uh, noting that there will be in-person voting. There will certainly be a lot more absentee, but there are still going to be places where you vote in person. So how do we make sure those people are safe? Um, but in addition to that, we don't want cyber to be on the back burner. It's important that cyber is still considered important and it's not lost in the COVID-19 conversation. And so that funding will allow the resources that are currently being siphoned away. And I'm not speaking from experience so much as just what I expect is probably happening, resources being siphoned away from what might have been a cyber related expense into more hand sanitizer because that's needed too. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I'm, I'm happy to get into it more, but when it comes to what I think is most important, election security bill, what's likely funding for the states. Thanks Judy. I got a uh, question that someone sent to me by text on, on my cell phone. Uh, and the question is a fairly open-ended one for you, just saying, look, we've talked a lot about the situation here in the U.S., but in the beginning of the talk, you talked about a more expansive program and Microsoft's global presence and uh, defending democracy across the globe. And it, could you talk a little bit about the unique challenges and differences to doing that in democracies other than the United States? Sure. Well, uh, the current challenge of us being a U.S.-based company and not being able to travel internationally, notwithstanding as a clear as a clear barrier, the program is uh, is internationally focused. We are a global program focused on democracies everywhere. Um, of course, we're going to have some of our premier um, programs start out in the U.S. In part because it's our home country; it's where we are. Also, because this was formed with the 2020 elections in the U.S. very much in mind. Um, but as far as international engagements, as I mentioned earlier, we've done a lot of training cybersecurity trainings. We've also expanded that account guard program that I mentioned, again, that started in the U.S. It's now in, I think, 29 different countries. Um, and uh, with that came a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of sort of persuasion, again, of local governments to allow us to offer it for free. So again, that's another place where that FEC opinion was helpful. We were able to take that with us to each country and say, this is the basis upon which we're making our argument here. Um, and we also have a program I didn't mention before that's M365 for campaigns. It's essentially saying we want to be able to offer our email services to campaigns at a reduced rate, um, our nonprofit pricing, but give them more security features. And so that was something we were able to launch in the US recently. And now we're starting to launch that um, in other countries as well. So we do tend to use the US as an incubator for some of our programs and our ideas, but we immediately internationalize them once we're able to and grow them um, to a, a bunch of different democracies depending in part on market, on need. Um, it's interesting how much interaction from our subsidiaries in those countries depend, um, our, how much our action is dependent upon their interest. Um, because we, what we wanna be really careful about is not going into another country and saying, we're the Americans and we're here to help. Um, because that is not taken well 
Um, and also, I do not have um, the expertise on all of these other cultures, um, certainly not how their election systems work. So we are really dependent upon our colleagues in those countries to guide us and to make sure that we're taking a respectful approach that will be effective um, and that we're solving a problem there because the problems that we perceive in the US are not the same in other countries. I'll, I'll even share um, a story. I, I don't think any of us have talked about this publicly, but I think that's fine. Um, we were really intent on doing something in India last year. Um, and our, our subsidiaries were on board. We were really excited about it. Um, but when we started rolling out the program there, we realized that election security just wasn't a big concern. People weren't worried about hacking from the Russians. That, that was not what they were concerned about. They were concerned about disinformation, particularly on applications like WhatsApp. Um, but we, we, the program we were trying to bring in to help uh, was not solving a problem that they perceived that they had. And so we had a lot of lessons from that where we came back and said, maybe it is a problem, they just don't know about it. If that's it, we start maybe with an education campaign. This is a problem, you all need to be aware. Here's what we think might be happening and how do we work with nonprofits and political parties to drive awareness around that versus just coming in with the solution and realizing nobody wanted it. I mean, they didn't, they didn't feel like they had a, a need for it. What I, what I like about that, Jeannie, also is this uh, idea of the size and the scope of an organization like Microsoft. If people want to actually understand how these different global public policy issues fit together, an organization like Microsoft is a really interesting place to be, particularly because of your local customers also. And I would imagine while Microsoft might be the US, local US company, a lot of your customers are local organizations also that would be attuned to the local problem. So that's uh, fascinating. We've got uh, another question, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing the person's name right, Achinta? Yeah, you got it. Go ahead. Um, hi, Jenny. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, I'm coming from an engineering background, and you've talked a lot about uh, public policy and how Microsoft has been working to implement policy in government. But what I wanted to ask you was, has Microsoft also taken the time to implement new technologies with the government, and have they been like working on a security-focused technology to like stop uh, election interference as well? And could you talk a little bit more about that, please? Well, it's going to sound like I planted you um, because yes, we have the one thing I haven't talked about that I'm also really excited that our program's been able to achieve um, is this program we call Election Guard. It's it's technology. It's actually an open source. You can find it on GitHub. It's an open source uh, uh, SDK, and we developed it in coordination with some some technology partners. Though it's really a Microsoft grown solution. It comes out of um, a se our senior cryptographer in Microsoft Research. His name is Dr. Josh Benelow. And while he's a cryptographer at Microsoft and that is his focus, his passion since he wrote his PhD thesis at Yale in I think 1985 has been how do you conduct secure um, uh, elections uh, while still maintaining a private ballot? Because I think is if you really think about the way the election process works, if you were to take away the privacy of our ballot, we can actually secure it pretty easily. Um, but of course, we're not gonna do that. that that's a very important component of how we vote. But when you include the anonymity around your vote, it makes securing it really, really challenging. And so he had sort of a theory that was mostly academic in the 80s. Um, the technology has since caught up with him around using a type of um, cryptography that's called, homo, uh, that's called homomorphic encryption. And I won't get into all of it in part because I can only go so far, um, but also uh, because uh, I'm happy to talk to anyone offline about it. But the way that this cryptography works, it allows you to essentially do math on data without decrypting it. Um, it doesn't work really well when you try and scale it to multiplication and division and, and complicated math, but elections are all about ones and zeros adding and subtracting. That is really just adding. Um, that is what elections are about. So if you're able to encrypt the results of an election in such a way that you can still verify it without revealing the contents of the ballot, you might have a way of doing what, what Dr. Benelow was looking to do, which is ensure a secure election. So we took this academic theory put together a, a team of engineers. Um, the, there's someone on my team who is actually a, a, a product manager who's spent years building complicated products at companies like Amazon and Gap and, and of course at Microsoft, who took this on. And, um, and we built this open source SDK. And the idea is we're not building voting systems, but we're building a component that can go into voting systems that enables a voter when they're done voting to get a tracking number. 
Um, we're all used to this concept. You get a tracking number when you order FedEx and you can see that your box made it to the doorstep. Um, and so that's essentially what it does. It lets you know your vote made it to the final tally. It is part of it um, without decrypting the results of that, elect of that vote. So I, I can talk about it more. I just realized we're running close on time and I, I could probably talk about an hour about election guard. To, to your question about application, we actually had a very successful pilot election using this technology in Wisconsin just before coronavirus hit. I mean, it was mid-February. It was right when we were all starting to get a little bit uh, nervous about it. Um, and it was a successful election. It was the first election guard election. There was actually a really great New Yorker article that just came out last week about it. Um, which I'm happy to send around if anyone would like to see. But it's, a, it's an exciting new technology that obviously isn't going to have huge impact in 2020, uh, but we do hope will be part of an election experience near you uh, sometime soon. And Judy, this is something I'm gonna wanna follow up with you about, about the homomorphic encryption implementation. We've done some work at, at Duke uh, around looking at homomorphic encryption implementations, particularly in the healthcare and financial sector services where distributed sort of federated um, machine learning analytics could be useful, but I've actually never thought about using that as an authentication mechanism and for election data. That's really interesting and might be something if you're willing to come down and come in and we could talk about as far as with a class and do a real deep dive in. I think that would be fascinating. Sure, we're actually working with students, I think at University of Washington, um, maybe in other locations where uh, if computer science students are interested, we have a, because it's open source, we need to build a verifier. Now we, we built one, but the idea is that there should be a lot of verifiers available that people can run this data through, do the, do the math and get the results without decrypting the files. And so it's, a, it's actually, from what I understand, a fairly simple sort of independent study type program. So we'd be happy to talk about that if any students are interested in building it. Uh, that's a great idea. Two, two more quick questions from students. And so the first is from Stephen and was asked in the Q&A uh, portion of the tool. And the question is, do you work with Microsoft Asia or specifically with Chinese counterparts? So I'm actually part of a broader team that's, and it's, it was a little bit in the name of this um, program that's called Digital Diplomacy. And uh, the Digital Diplomacy team takes on a lot of other issues. So I'm focused on the Defending Democracy piece, but we have a whole team that's focused on cyber peace. Um, and that's a lot more around the norms I was alluding to earlier, like how do we create these international norms to ensure that we, we as citizens are secure and safe from nation state attacks. Um, and we have a whole team in China that we work closely with on a lot of the um, cybersecurity policy related issues, especially around more of the digital diplomacy side of our work. Um, and of course we have colleagues in China that we work with on the product side as well. Um, I, there's no specific project or uh, or anything where we're like just working with our Chinese colleagues, um, but they're certainly part of our everyday interactions. Thanks. Last question then, uh, or last student question, and I have a closing question then. Uh, so this is from TJ, and it's, uh, he says, I'm curious about NewsGuard and how it maintains neutrality and whether or not there are safeguards against hurting users to our particular narrative. It's a really awesome question because it's the one that had us most concerned when we first took on the, the partnership, when we were sort of vetting them and the work that they were doing. And just quickly, so that you know their leadership, they have uh, co-founders, Steve Brill, who is sort of a well-known creator of Court TV, a big personality and a journalist um, and, and author in his own right, and Gordon Kravitz. So Gordon was an editor or publisher at Wall Street Journal, um, is considered to be a little bit more center right when it comes to the journalism world. And so the two of them are viewed in, in many corners as being sort of left and right. Um, they both come from those, those various uh, partisan-ish backgrounds while still being journalists, of course. Um, and so they're the ones that founded this and that was important to them that this not have a partisan looking um, edge. When we first looked over the ratings they did without their knowledge, we did our own uh, research. We had a team of researchers map before looking at any of the results, map the uh, top 100 sites um, according to perceived bias. So, you know, put the foxnews.com on the right and put uh, Daily Coast maybe on the left and just went through and did that categorization and then went through and looked at how the rankings turned out. And it was almost dead even because what we found in the research is the sites that are printing fake and uh, falsifying news tend to be on the extremes of both sides. Um, there's going to be stuff you'll occasionally disagree with that comes a little bit closer to the center, but the, but the ones who are really putting out 
the disinformation and the conspiracy theories, there are people doing that on both sides of the spectrum. Um, and so the last check, they were, they were relatively even. It's something we do keep an eye on and it's something we're very aware of. Um, but I think it's a, it's, while it's not the only solution, it's certainly not the only solution to media literacy and disinformation. I think they're a pretty good tool in the toolbox. And I think that they behave in a way that from what I've witnessed is pretty fair. What I, what I like about that is using the technology to measure the problem and to measure the solution. And part of the future of journalism is having people who have expertise and training who can take a look at what the effects are. And it sounds like Microsoft is relying on those folks. So Jenny, last question, uh, as we're just over. If you had one piece of advice that you could give to undergraduates or graduate students of something they should do to invest in their education to best prepare them for a path forward towards making a high impact in cyber policy, what would that recommendation be? Well, it's kind of one I already gave. I wish I had something stronger here, but I still think that the best thing to do is to follow your interests. I was so sure I wanted to be a psychology major when I got into college and I took a few of the classes and I realized I wasn't as interested or as engaged. And I could have done that and broken through and you know, I'm sure done just fine. But I realized as I followed my, where my interests were, it's, it's really what helps you advance in your career. Because if you like what you do every day, you're gonna do it better. Um, and then the other plug I'll make just because we have a lot of young people on this call is consider being a poll worker. I know that's not the question you asked at all, um, but it's, it's a really important one now more than ever um, because a lot of our elderly poll workers are not going to be comfortable going to the polls this fall um, because they are afraid of getting sick, frankly, and we need younger people who are willing to step up and fill in for them. Um, because they're just, the numbers are going to be problematic. And when you have fewer poll workers, it means you have fewer polling locations, which means you have longer lines. And that really uh, unfairly tends to end up in disenfranchised communities. So if you care about access to the ballot for people, especially people who tend to be disenfranchised, consider being a poll worker. Great pieces of advice. And I'm really glad you added the second piece there, getting students, particularly and young people, involved at that level in politics, I think is critically important. Ginny, thank you so much. I love the comment about telling students to follow their passions. For anybody who's on this, who realizes how interested you are in these issues, one way you can do that is I'm teaching intro to cyber policy this fall. Hopefully Ginny will be coming and guesting in there. We'll be talking about homomorphic encryption and elections in more depth plenty of opportunities to get involved doing research. So just contact it. And Ginny, thank you so much. It's amazing to see Duke graduates doing such incredibly important and impactful work. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for sticking with us, guys. Take care. Take care, Ginny. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Bye-bye.